Jude chapter 3, we read the exhortation that we are to contend earnestly for the faith which was once delivered all to all the saints. The, the root of the Greek word is translated contend is agonizomai, which is where we get the word, the English word agonize. It has a sense of struggling with great difficulty, endeavoring with strenuous zeal, even fighting with opponents. And Christians are called to do this work with regard to the tenets of the Christian faith. We are to contend earnestly for the Christian faith. And as we look down through the history of of our church, we see that the church has risen up to contend earnestly for the faith in every generation. For truths such as the full deity and humanity of Jesus Christ, the doctrine of the Trinity, the doctrine of sin, justification by faith alone, the authority and inerrancy of the Bible, and so on. Every generation, the church is faced with new challenges, new battles, new opportunities to contend for the faith. And while we're never to take our foot off the gas pedal, if you would, with any key truth, it becomes increasingly convinced, or I become increasingly convinced that the key issue for this generation is over the doctrine of the church. Over the last several decades, we have witnessed the, the devaluing, the the disengaging and the dismissing of the church by those who would claim the name of Christ as we become more and more distracted with hobbies and miscellaneous tasks. The church has fallen farther and farther into the background culturally. Sundays are no longer sacred. For many people, it's just another day off. Church attendance for many has become comfortably optional, and it's gotten even worse than that. Over the last few years... Many people have seized on the isolated instances of church abuse as an excuse to attack the church at large. What has become known as the Me Too movement has also given birth to the Church Too movement, providing ample opportunities to tell horror stories about church abuse. And while we readily and rightly denounce any and all instances of genuine abuse, we ought also to oppose the myth that the church is only ever a haven for abuse and exploitation. But all too often we hear the sentiment repeated, I love Jesus, but I just don't like the church. Or even I've heard this, I love Jesus, but I hate the church. If all that wasn't enough salt on the wound, 2020 saw the wide-scale shutdown of all entities deemed non-essential. While grocery stores and gas stations and home improvement stores and even abortion clinics were permitted to remain open, churches were deemed non-essential and shut down for months and in some parts of the world for the better part of two years. Optional, non-essential, even toxic. That's how many view the church today. Now, that may be how the world sees the church, and that might even be how some in the church see the church, But the key question for us, this is where I want to spend all of our time today, how does Christ see the church? One of the most prolific writers on the doctrine of the church was the Puritan pastor John Cotton. If you know me well, you know I love John Cotton, and there's more to come with that in the future, I hope. But all of Cotton's writings were so impactful that all of the New England churches, so you go back to the 1600s, All of the New England churches of the 1600s and the 1700s were patterned after his articulation of church polity, and it actually became known as the New England way. We had our own way of doing church because we believed that what we had for polity was actually biblical. And John Cotton really produced more than 12 uh, titles, a dozen titles on the church. And some of his books, if you were to look them up, there include titles such as The Way of Churches in New England, Then he expounded even further the way of churches cleared. He talked about the makeup of a church. There's a book called The True Constitution of a Particular Visible Church. Then he has one called On the Holiness of Church Members. And then there's one that was probably his most famous called The Keys of the Kingdom of Heaven. Uh, This was actually presented to the Westminster Assembly for their consideration. John Cotton himself was invited with two other delegates from America, but they never went to Westminster because... As uh, Thomas Hooker put it, we don't want to travel 3,000 miles to agree with three people. So we're going to stay home and let them do their thing. I wish they had gone. I really wish they had gone. It would have been good. Anyway, this is what he presented to them. 
Now, it'd be tempting for us to think that John Cotton was only ever about church order. And that's a a lot of times when we talk about uh, church polity and, and church government, it seems to be that we're just being sticklers about church order. In fact, that's what many scholars think. However, John Cotton was a loving shepherd who affectionately referred to his church as lilies among the thorns. One of my favorite books of the Bible, or one of his favorite books of the Bible to teach from, was the Song of Solomon, or what is also known as the Song of Songs. Now, rightly so, we scratch our heads, and we say to ourselves, well, isn't the Song of Solomon about the erotic joys of married love? Isn't this just about marriage? But John Cotton believed that the songs was an allegory meant to describe the loving relationship between Christ and the church. Frankly, the book fascinated him, so much so that he published two commentaries on the Song of Solomon. In fact, he believed that the songs was, was, was written for a threefold purpose, and he, he articulates this threefold purpose. He believes that the Song of Solomon was written, number one, to express the affection and relation between Christ and his church in general. So how does Christ view the church, just generally speaking? The second application was that this is meant to express the affection and relation between Christ and every sincere believer, so you individually. And then thirdly, he actually sees uh, Song of Solomon as being the estate and condition of every single church historically from the time of Solomon to the Last Judgment. So we also saw the the construction of that book as a historical uh, timeline as well. Now, with this understanding in mind, he, he taught that the songs uh, really was, was written for our edification, for our exhortation, but it was also written to magnify and glorify Christ. But Cotton wasn't the only one who believed this. In fact, for centuries, this was the, the prominent interpretation, prevalent interpretation. In fact, numerous preachers from Origen in the 3rd century to Jerome, to John Owen, to Charles Spurgeon, they all seized on this beautifully poetic language of the Song of Solomon to articulate Christ's love for His church. And they seized on verses like Psalm 115, You are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. Writing in the early 5th century, a pastor named Eponius writes, Having been cleansed from every habit of the vices of the flesh, and converted to the one true God from the worship of a multitude of shameful gods, Christ the Lord praises the twin beauty of the church, both body and soul. So he articulates that, that when Christ or when the, when the writer is talking about the beauty, the physical beauty that's meant to reflect the body and soul of the church, he says, first, for the beauty of the soul, that it would know its creator, and second, that it would know the reason it was created. You are beautiful, my love. You behold, you are beautiful. Baptist commentator John Gill writes this, Christ here setting forth the greatness and excellency of the church's beauty is introduced wondering at the comeliness which he himself had put upon her. And much more reason we have to wonder at it that we who are by nature children of wrath, whose natures are corrupted and depraved, who are both by actual and original sin, black and uncomely and deformed, are now fair and beautiful in Christ through His blood and righteousness. End quote. That's just lovely. That Christ would regard us as beautiful in His eyes. Even first and second century Jewish rabbis considered the Song of Songs to be an allegory to the loving relationship between God and His people. One named Rabbi Akiva, even noting that out of all the sacred writings, they are holy, but the Song of Songs is the Holy of Holies. Now, to be fair, virtually all of the modern commentators have rejected this allegorical interpretation of the songs. And they have sound exegetical reasons for doing so, I believe. But I cannot help but marvel at the way that Christians throughout the course of history saw their relationship to Christ. That they would view their relationship to Jesus through this lens. Not as an impersonal, transactional relationship. That I believe in Him and He saves me. More than that, they saw their relationship to Christ as a a vibrant relationship intimate, 
loving, exciting relationship full of sweetness and wonder, much like a healthy marriage. They saw themselves, believers throughout the course of history, saw themselves as the spouse of Christ. But is this the only place that we find such understanding of this relationship to Christ? Well, not at all. In fact, turn with me to Ephesians chapter 5. Ephesians chapter 5. This would be the Song of Solomon of the New Testament, if you will, this passage. Paul's teaching in Ephesians 5 is probably one of the most descriptive passages in the New Testament on marriage. Much is written about marriage in the Bible, but here is really the most vivid passage, I believe. And in this passage here, there is sort of an allegory set up where the husband is likened to Christ and the wife is likened to the church. And this helps not only to define the roles, but also to, to paint a, a beautiful picture of what God intends every marriage to be. God has a desire and a design for marriage, and it's here. Because after this, we see in chapter 6 that God has a desire for children, and as well, He has a desire for, for masters and their servants, and so God has a desire and a design for everything He's created. But when we go back here and we explore the doctrine of the church, we get a window into how the Lord sees His people. And as we're going to see, in light of what we've been talking about already this morning, this is very familiar. Ephesians chapter 5, starting in verse 22. Wives, be subject to your own husbands as to the Lord. For the husband is the head of the wife, just as Christ also is the head of the church. He himself being the Savior of the body. But as the church is subject to Christ, so also the wives ought to be to their own husbands in everything. Husbands, love your wives, just as Christ also loved the church and gave himself up for her, so that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, that he might present to himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless." So husbands ought to also love their own wives as their own bodies. For he who loves his own wife loves himself, for no one ever hated his own flesh, but nourishes and cherishes it, just as Christ also does the church, because we are members of his body. For this reason a man shall leave his father and mother, and shall be joined to his wife, and the two shall become one flesh. Look at verse 32. This mystery is great. And and you might pause and say, well, what mystery are you talking about, Paul? Talking about marriage? He says, but I'm speaking with reference to Christ and the church. He's using marriage to speak about Christ and the church. Verse 33, nevertheless, while we're still talking about marriage, he says, nevertheless, each individual among you also is to love his own wife even as himself, and the wife must see to it that she respects her husband. Now again, I don't want to rehearse all of the teaching here on marriage, except for where it shines light on Christ and the church, but I want to look at the dynamic that Paul illustrates here. He's building on the structure of how a marriage is supposed to be. Paul is identifying how the church functions in relationship to Christ, and he stacks it up to a marriage relationship. And we see that it very much is a a marital relationship with Christ being pictured as the husband in verses 23 and 25 and the church being pictured as the wife in verse 23 and 24. Again, same construction as the Song of Solomon. Same construction as the story about Hosea and his wife Gomer. But Jesus Christ here then is seen as the head of the church, meaning he is her leader, her protector, and her authority. And the church is his body in full submission to the head, as we see in Colossians 1.18. Now, the responsibility of the church is to submit herself to Christ, verse 22, and to respect him, verse 33. Not only is this the church in general, but this is also every single believer individually. That's you and me. We are to submit ourselves, you and me, to Jesus Christ. Every Christian is to live in full submission, full obedience to Jesus Christ as Lord. But I want, to, I want you to see how Christ sees His bride, the church. Look at verse 25. Paul tells husbands to love their wives. And I would tell you on behalf of 
The Apostle Paul and the Lord Jesus Christ, husbands, love your wives. And what is the standard for this love? Because you might say, well, I don't know how to do that. What is the standard for this kind of love? Look at the text. Christ is. Christ is the standard. Love your wives just as Christ also loved the church. Well, how did he do this? How did Christ love the church? By giving himself up for her. Now, in the context, that is salvation. That Jesus went to the cross, spread out his arms wide, was nailed to the Roman crossbar, hands and feet with a crown of thorns on his head, and even in death pierced in the side, he gave himself up and died to pay for the sins of his bride to redeem us. That's how he gave himself up for us. And so God's people, when he is, uh, has elected them, has spirit, they are spiritually dead and they're dirty and they're adulterous. They're, we're children of wrath, the Bible says. We're like the wife of Hosea who left him and committed adultery. And yet, yet, Hosea takes her back despite her unfaithfulness. And despite our unfaithfulness, Christ lays down his life for us and buys us back and gives himself up for us. That is selfless, sacrificial love. That is a husband's love for his wife. So you want to know, husbands, how to love your wives? That's how you do it. To give yourself up for your wife. And again, going back to Christ and giving himself up for her in dying, look at verse 26, he sanctifies her. That is talking about spiritual cleansing. Spiritual cleansing. Now, we know that this is both what's called positional sanctification, that that we're cleansed from all sins on the cross. That was a a one-time work that Christ did to redeem us, that we're positionally, in terms of where we stand with Christ, we're sanctified. But it also is involving progressive sanctification, a constant cleansing from daily sins through the Spirit's work in our life. So yes, we're, we're baptized into the blood of Christ to save us, but then we're also sprinkled and we're cleansed over the course of time until we get to glory. But make no mistake about it, the husband cleanses his wife. And he does so primarily, with, look at the text, by the washing of water with the Word. That's Scripture. Scripture. By reading the Word of God. By meditating on the Word of God. By hearing the Word of God. Christ cleanses the church through the Word of God. This is why, beloved, the preaching of the Scriptures is so important. Now, can you get the Scriptures through personal reading? Yes, you can. Through Bible studies and meditation? And can you sing the praises in the Scriptures? Yes, you can. But I'll tell you, preaching is the truth of the Word of God set on fire ablaze and delivered to you in a power-packed punch, if it's done right. And so this is the way that Christ cleanses and washes and sanctifies the bride is through the ministry of the Word. That's why this pulpit is in the center of the room to you. Not because of me, the preacher. I'm nothing. I'm just a voice in the wilderness crying out. It's the Word of God alighted and delivered to you. That's how Christ cleanses and washes and sanctifies. And so our growth and sanctification is directly connected to our prolonged exposure to the Word of God, to the Bible. And what is the goal of such loving cleansing? Look at verse 27. This is so lovely. That He might present to Himself the church in all her glory, having no spot or wrinkle or any such thing, but that she would be holy and blameless. That's Christ's goal for you. That's His goal for the bride. Jesus works to redeem and cleanse His bride, the church, in order to make her pure and holy and blameless and glorious, resplendent. Resplendent. The word resplendent refers to something that is shining brilliantly or glowing in splendor or gorgeous or gleaming or beautiful. It's a marvelous word. And that is Christ's goal for the church, to present the body of Christ, the church, His bride, to present her as lovely. 
But Christ takes personal responsibility for this. He doesn't even hand it over to pastors or elders. He doesn't say, here, you you go do all this. He is promising to do this. Now, he uses means to do so, but he takes ownership. Look at verse 29. It says that regarding Christ's efforts toward the body, he nourishes and cherishes it. He does this. He nourishes the church by cleansing and ministering and forgiving sins and caring for and protecting and sanctifying and comforting. In His love, He cherishes her. And we actually see this demonstrated to us. If you were to turn with me to Ezekiel 16. This is an Old Testament example, an illustration of this truth. In the course of Ezekiel 16, we see a parable of God's love for Israel, even despite her unfaithfulness to Him. But I want you to to look with me at how this love is displayed. And this language is very vivid. So vivid. But it is quite stunning. Ezekiel 16, starting in verse 6. This is the voice of the Lord. When I passed by you, I saw you squirming in your blood. And I said to you, while you were in your blood, live! Yes, I said to you, while you were in your blood, live. I made you numerous like plants of the field. Then you grew up, became tall, and reached the age for fine ornaments. Your breasts were formed and your hair had grown. Yet you were naked and bare. Then I passed by you and saw you, and behold, you were at the time for love, so I spread my skirt over you and covered your nakedness. I also swore to you and entered into a covenant with you that you became mine, declares the Lord God. Then I bathed you with water, washed off your blood from you, and anointed you with oil. I also clothed you with embroidered cloth and put sandals of porpoise skin on your feet. Then I wrapped you with fine linen and covered you with silk." I adorned you with ornaments, put bracelets on your hands, and a necklace around your neck. I also put a ring in your nostril, earrings in your ears, and a beautiful crown on your head. Thus, you were adorned with gold and silver, and your dress was of fine linen, silk, and embroidered cloth. You ate fine flour, honey, and oil, so you were exceedingly beautiful and advanced in royalty." Then your fame went forth among the nations on account of your beauty, for it was perfect because of my splendor, which I bestowed on you, declares the Lord. Oh my, what a beautiful picture. Beautiful picture of of love and of cleansing and nourishing and cherishing and restoration of a husband seeing his wife and and carrying her up from the dust, if you will, cleaning her off and adorning her with the most fine and beautiful ornaments, purifying her and treating her as high and beautiful and lifted up. This is the love that God had for the nation of Israel, and it's also the love that Christ has for the church. Notice that it is, it is the Lord that beautifies. He is the one who makes us lovely. We read passages like this in Ezekiel and we read Ephesians 5. And you can almost hear the voice of the Lord whispering, You are beautiful, my love. Behold, you are beautiful. John Owen writes this, Christ gives Himself to the soul with all His excellencies righteousness, preciousness, graces and eminencies, to be its Savior, head and husband, forever to dwell with it in this holy relation. He looks upon the souls of His saints, likes them well, counts them fair and beautiful, because He has made them so. Behold, you are fair, my companion. Behold, you are fair. You have dove's eyes, He notes, Psalm 115. Let others think what they please. Christ redoubles it, that the souls of His saints are very beautiful, even perfect, through His comeliness which He puts upon them. 
It's like Owen was reading Ezekiel 16 when he wrote that. I'm sure he was. But again, the church has life and salvation and sanctification and glory only in Christ. See, the world, they look at the church and they see only sinners outwardly. And I'll tell you, they they note our mistakes. They have a long list of all our mistakes. And they conveniently forget our good deeds, too. And I, there's not a week that goes by when I go onto social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or what, pick your poison, and I don't see somebody blasting the church or blasting the ministry and all these people commenting and liking and sharing and it's this big, huge hate fest of the bride of Christ. And I think to myself, do you have any idea who you're slandering? Do you have any idea who loves this body? If you knew the Lord who loved the bride, you would not say such things. And if you saw the church the way Christ did, you would cover your mouth in shame. And so, yes, we have our mistakes. Yes, we have our sins. Yes, whole churches and whole ministries have done terrible things. Whole denominations have espoused terrible things. Outwardly. And yet the world is so easy to judge us harshly and slander the weakest of us. And so to the world, the church is ugly and imperfect and rigid and despised. And sadly, there are some within the church who think the same thing. But take heart, that is not the way that Christ sees us. Even in the opening of his letter to the church in Corinth, now Corinth was a struggling church. You read the, first, the letter of 1 Corinthians, and it's, it's, it's painful to read sometimes. So much so that in 2 Corinthians, Paul says, look, I know I said some hard things, but I still love you. He has to kind of backpedal a little bit, not off the main point, but off of his own feelings. But this is is what Paul says. I want to listen to this. The Apostle Paul writes to the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ Jesus, saints by calling, with all who in every place call on the name of our Lord Jesus, their Lord and ours. And so even an embattled church, a struggling church, a wayward church, Paul is careful to call them saints who have been sanctified in Christ. Now he's going to take them to task on a few things. But before he does that, he wants to acknowledge, look, you are beloved. You are saints by calling. You are those who Christ has sanctified and redeemed. I'm going to tread lightly here. And every minister of the gospel, every pastor, every elder ought to tread lightly with the bride of Christ, even when they are in sin. Even in a battle way where church, Paul calls them those who have been sanctified, cleansed, washed. We are, as 1 Timothy 3.15 says, the household of God, the church of the living God, the pillar and buttress of the truth. And so the Lord Jesus, He doesn't look down His nose at His people. He doesn't look at you with derision and scorn. He's not ashamed of them. He's not loveless and harsh or abusive. That's not our Christ. He is the one whom our soul loves. And we are His beloved. But when we take note of the resplendent beauty of the church, how are we to understand this? These final points I want to stress to you possibly three helpful ways to understand this beauty of the church. Number one, the church's beauty is a reflected beauty. It is a reflected beauty. Remember, the church is gathered up and comprised of individual believers, you and me and others who confess Christ. And although believers are redeemed and growing in Christ, we still sin. We're still afflicted by our flesh. And so the question then becomes sort of a conundrum. If God hates sin so much, how come He calls us beautiful? It's because every Christian has had their sins paid for by Christ, and we as individual believers have been wrapped in the robe of Christ's righteousness. He takes His fine royal robe, if you could say that from Ezekiel 16, He takes His his beautifully silken robe and wraps it around us like a garment and clothes us with His own righteousness. 
So much so that when God looks at us, He sees the beauty of His own Son. My good friend Dustin Benge has written a book on the beauty and the glory of the church titled, The Loveliest Place. I would commend this to you. On this notion of reflected glory, he writes this, The beauty of the church is not the type of romantic or inherently attractive beauty that causes one to blush. The church would never adorn the cover of a magazine because she is beautiful. Again, the church is not itself intrinsically beautiful. He adds this then, The supreme expression of God's beauty is of His Son, Jesus Christ, who Himself is the image and the radiance of the Father. The church is a gift from God to His Son. Therefore, as the Son is a reflection of the Father, the church, as the eternal bride, is a reflection of the Son. You see the relationship there? We reflect the Son the same way the the Son reflects the Father. And when you think of the church... If you desire to see it the way that God does, you would see a gathering of people who have been redeemed and who are growing in grace. In essence, beloved, we are trophies of God's grace. And so the church is beautiful not because of our inherent beauty, but because of Christ, who is altogether lovely, who has made us beautiful in Him. Number two, The church's beauty is a sanctified beauty. What is the substance of beauty? Remember, we're talking, we're not talking about magazine covers and outward appearances here. What is it that causes the Lord to say, You are beautiful, my love? It is her holiness, her sanctification, her Christ likeness. I think about Proverbs charm is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman who fears the Lord, she is the one to be praised. It's not outward appearances. It's not what we look like physically. It's not even the the cool things we do. The way we decorate our church building. The programs that we have. That's not the beauty of the church. The beauty of the church is holiness. Christ-likeness. Matthew Henry notes this. There is a real beauty in holiness that all who are sanctified are thereby beautified. That's a cool phrase, isn't it? All those who are sanctified are thereby beautified. So your beauty before Christ is the holiness that He has wrought in you. Not R-O-T-W-R-O-U-G-H-T, okay? That He's brought about inside of you. We read Philippians 2.13 with regard to our constant work and sanctification, that it is God, it is God, it is God who is at will, at work in you both to will and to work for His good pleasure. God works in you. He gets inside of you through the ministry of the Spirit. He begins to change you. Your thoughts and your impulses and your intentions, your heart begins to change. Your mind begins to change. Your speech begins to change. Your deeds begin to change. God is at work in you for His good pleasure. And so it pleases God when we grow in holiness and righteousness. That's when He looks at us and says, oh, that's beautiful. That's lovely. When sinners begin to be stripped away from their old sinful impulses and actions and thoughts, when they become more and more like Jesus Christ, God looks at that, His own Son, and says, oh, that's beautiful. That's what He sees. And so when you become more like Jesus Christ... That is what the Father regards as true beauty. 1 Thessalonians 4.3 says that sanctification is God's will for us. It's His delight. And it's how we reflect His own beauty. He sees it Himself in us. Lastly, number three, the church's beauty is an increasing beauty. The more that Christians grow in Christ... And the more their sins are put to death, and the more that they develop godly character, the more they learn to love and serve one another, the church becomes all the more beautiful increasing. Our problem is that we're not oftentimes patient enough to allow others to grow. We want people to be patient with us when we're growing, right? Hey, I'm still in process here. We want people to be patient with us, but we're not patient with them oftentimes. Well, how come you're not more godly? Well, how come you're not more godly, right? But isn't, isn't it patience 
to grow increasingly. We expect instant godliness from all other believers. But praise God, He doesn't demand instant and complete sanctification from us right now. We couldn't give it. There's no way we could give it right now in the flesh. But by God's grace and by His mercy and His loving kindness, He is patient with His church. But He promises, Philippians 1, 6, that He who began a good work in you will complete it in the day of Christ Jesus. He doesn't let up. I began a good work in you, and I'm going to keep on working. And we push back, and we rebel, and we sin, and we have all these issues and problems and indwelling sins, and God just puts the pressure, and He keeps on sanctifying. And we push back, and we rebel, and He brings trials. And we fight, and we push back, and He brings affliction. And sometimes it gets heavier and heavier, but then He also brings comfort. Romans 2.4 says, it's the kindness of God that leads to repentance. And so He brings in all of these works of loving kindness and patience and mercy and grace and truth and afflictions and difficulties and trials and opposition. And we're molded and we're beaten down like a piece of metal in the metallurgist's fire. And God is purifying and cleansing off the dross. And we feel it, don't we? We feel the opposition from the world. We feel the sanctification. But yet the Lord looks at us and says, I'm making you lovely. I'm making you like Christ. I'm making you beautiful. Because your holiness, your Christ-likeness is beautiful in my eyes. And when we see that, when we realize that, we respond and we say, thank you, Lord. Because I hate my old self too. I hate my sins. I don't want to be the old me, but I don't know how to change. I'm changing you. But the church is becoming sanctified. The church is growing in Christ. The church is being made beautiful. But when Christ looks at us, He treats us as though we are. He doesn't slander us. He doesn't shame us. He hates our sins. But He loves us. He loves the sinner. He's a friend to sinners. My question then is, do we see each other that way? Do we see each other as trophies of God's grace? As beautiful in His eyes? Even when we're sinned against. And when believers, other believers hurt us. Or they disappoint us. Or they're not growing the way that we think they should be growing. Do we see them as lovely in God's eyes? Do we treat them tenderly? Are we eager to forgive? Are we eager to extend ourselves to them? Are we eager to bear with them in love? Are we either eager to, to minister to them and comfort them in patience? Beloved, if we saw one another the way that Christ does, we would. We would. Do we see the church the way that Jesus does. It would change the way that we engaged, wouldn't it? But I believe that we're meant to. And so our our task here and our goal in all of this, this series, Pastor Dan and myself together as teaching this body of believers here, is that you might see the church as resplendent, the church dependent, the church militant, the church diligent, and the church triumphant. Heavenly Father, we thank You for Your Word. We thank You that You have this love for us. That You don't see us in our former condition as saints. That You actually regard us as beloved, not because of anything that we have done, We have no inherent righteousness, no inherent beauty, but yet you look on us, as the Bible says, formerly dead in our trespasses and sins, children of wrath like the rest of mankind, and you saw us dead and defiled in our blood. You looked at us and you said, live, and you made us alive together with Christ 
For by grace we have been saved through faith. And God, this has not been of ourselves that we would have any reason to boast. No, this is because You took pity on sinners and redeemed us for Your glory and made us, we are the the workmanship of Your hands and You've given us work to do on this earth. Good deeds, love for others, a mission to fulfill, all for Your good purpose, O Lord. And so God, I plead with You And I praise You that You have given Dan and I the honor of proclaiming Your Word to Your people. The honor and the joy of telling Your beloved bride how beautiful they are in Your eyes. Lord, that we might see this beauty not to become prideful, but yet to become thankful and to be ever exulting in praise and adoration of the one true God who gave up all for us, our Lord Jesus Christ. We thank you for this salvation. In Jesus' holy name, amen.